All right. Professor Kete, thank you so much for doing this. I, um, for people who do not know Professor Kete, um, I'm going to append the entire length of his introduction in the show notes and you can read up on that. But it is, if, if I had to summarize Professor Kite in one line, as far as me as a point of reference goes, I've been trying to have this conversation for a good amount of the last half year. So I'm, I'm glad I can finally make this happen. Thank you so much. It's good to be here. It's good to see you. No, it's good to see you, Professor. I, I was wondering, how's online, how's online teaching going for you? Online teaching is okay. Yeah. One thing that I really like about it is that, well, first of all, when I teach a seminar, and I have big seminars, you know, maybe 40, 50 people, it's great because on two screens, I can see everybody. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're in a class live and you're walking around, you look at one person, you look at another person. Right. But with, with Zoom, you can see 25 on one screen, switch mm-hmm. to see 25. The other great thing about it is that, uh, except when people use the artificial backgrounds, it's really wonderful to go into everyone's home. Mm-hmm with mm-hmm. them right it's it, it has a sense of uh intimacy and connection that actually real life doesn't have of course real life has some other ones that online doesn't have too right right so it, it is almost as if um you are claim you, you you are seeing the university to be an artifice of connection instead if, if the university is removed that is more of a connection possible because you're actually visiting the core territory of each individual that you're teaching. Yeah. And there, you know, and sometimes there'll be a a baby crying in the background or they'll talk about their parents, you know, or, or they'll be with friends and Uh you can say hello to their friends or a cat will jump up on someone's shoulder. It's all all very nice. I'm curious though, having taken a class with you myself, if the students find that they're missing something out, in the physical absence of your um, very articulate self. You have a way of telling stories that is very unique. There is, there is an element that makes me want to wait. And I am of the more enthusiastic variety of people. Patience does not come naturally to me. I wonder if the students find that they're missing something. Do you, have they said something to you about that? No. Although, you know, I've also been doing uh, meditation, guided meditations with with my students really directed toward handling the current situation. Very and, nice. uh, and, you know, that's been a very nice way to connect also. I haven't, I mean, I miss, I miss my students. I miss seeing them. I miss uh, sitting with them. Right. But, you know, this is what life has given us right now. Mm-hmm. And in a sense, we're very lucky because had this happened 20 years ago, uh, well, we might have been able to call up on the phone long distance. Or 30 or 40 or 50 years ago, maybe nothing. Mm-hmm. You know, so uh, if, you can, if you can handle a lot of Zoom, right. a lot of FaceTime, and a lot of house party, um, it's, it's a nice way to connect also. Right. I mean... It's your class happens to be one of my favorite classes. And you know very well that I am not the only one who'd ever say that there is enough people I have uh, read feedback from. I've taken feedback from about your class and all of them tend to say that this is one class that you do not want to miss at Columbia. If I was to rate, if I was to rate my experience at Columbia and break the elements into sub elements and then talk about which was the most, um, let's say the most alive I had felt in a classroom the most connected to something tangible that I'd felt in the classroom was the play that you invoke as a, as a function of probably just your personality, because the subject matter that we're discussing reincarnation is not, is not something that you play with, right? It's, it's more, far more serious than that, but as a function of your personality and as a function of the structure of the class, it involves a sense of play, a sense of abstraction, a sense of speculation, a sense of going beyond. Right. Um, and I, I, I feel like there is something to be said about having play physically proximate to you and having play virtually, you know, uh, distant from you. And so if I was a student in your class, if I was a student in your class, I would not probably be the happiest about Zoom. Uh, I cannot say that for all of my other classes, though. <laughs> but, but Well, but that's for well sure. you know what? The thing is that. Uh, 
I think we can use this technology uh, for greater connection. So, so now in, uh, in my courses, I'm having a lot of one-on-one. -on -one. And in some smaller groups where we have, you know, three or four or five of us. And, and always every class starts really with a check-in. Where are you? How are you? Um, when I give bigger, when I give bigger lectures, like at Tibet House or, uh, or at other monasteries and, and Buddhist places around town, I always like to start by saying, okay, everybody, you know, when, it's phys when we're physically present, let's greet each other. Turn to your neighbors, introduce yourself. Right. Right. And, and, and so I think the, the key to creating a comfortable environment is really making it about the students hmm. because because the student in a seminar which i love i really don't like to lecture but in a seminar we have enormous not only collective intelligence with all of you but collective emotion collective love I mean, you have, you have a, a group of very smart people in their early 20s or late teens, full of life, and you are the next generation. It is your generation who will change the world and change humanity. So that because my classes deal with very often with technology and the present and the future, even if we all so deal with reincarnation, et cetera, which also is about the future, mm -hmm. that really comes down, that really comes down to all of you. Mm -hmm. So, so the, uh, I've always been enormously impressed by what happens when you can create a positive, safe, friendly environment, and mm -hmm. then you see amazing things happen. Mm -hmm. You right. know, you know, you know, these days, uh, these days, you know, you turn on the television, you look at the internet, whatever it is, and there's a lot of, uh, a lot of negativity. And of course, uh, a lot of wonderful things you see happening too. But I've always been uh, really impressed by the contrast between the news and what we experience when we actually are out with people hmm, hmm. if you and I let growing up in New York you know the, the two big uh, popular papers uh, not for the intellectuals were the New York Post and the Daily News and I used to think of them and call them crime news hmm. because basically most of the stories were about crimes that happened but but you and I know that 99 percent of the people that you meet even if you don't know them, even if you were walking down the street in a, in a strange city, if you needed it, it would give you the shirt off of their back. You know, so if we create conditions where people can do that, either in a classroom with students or any kind of group or living situation, I think the results uh, are, are amazing and wonderful. Right. But, you know, so I... I absolutely completely to the t agree with what you said in fact i've experienced what you've just spoken about being in your class and i've experienced people giving personal accounts about their lives that i would expect reasonably to come in places that are constructed for vulnerability right which is absolutely not what the university as an institution intends to do the university it is not that it devalues emotion it just values logic and reason and 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 you know the sciences and and, and all of that a lot more while you stand separated in your adventure in your enterprise for this class where you seem to value the emotional space the space of vulnerability a lot more as well i'm i wonder why that happens to be the case why do you why do you invest yourself in that direction given that the university is absolutely oriented in a different fashion well i came to teaching after many years doing a lot of other things uh, although i was always uh, drawn to Buddhist teaching, starting when I was really about 15 years old. Um, 
you know, I then really went into the world and uh, I was a lawyer. I helped really tens of thousands of people get through difficult financial circumstances. And I always, and I always loved just the personal interaction uh, with, with each of them. I, you know, maybe it has to do with just, just the way I was made. You know, maybe karma, my parents, who knows. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but to me, the sense of personal connection and, uh, and giving people the space to express themselves, that kind of, of safer space, it just really comes naturally. You know, and then when I... Then when I found at some point the writings of Paulo Freire, the great Brazilian revolutionary who critiqued what he called the banking method of education, where the teacher dispenses knowledge like deposits and the students passively receive the knowledge. The teacher is active, the students are passive and all of that. When I read that, it really struck a chord in me. Um, because of course, right, what we need is a collective enterprise. And you know, the, the, I'd say that, uh, and I teach that way also, I have a program that, uh, that I started uh, uptown uh, and uh, in Harlem for people who otherwise couldn't have this kind of, of education. And so, so when I started it about seven or eight years ago, uh, I only looked for professors who could teach. I had some very prominent people, heads of departments, uh, want to teach and even volunteer. But when I spoke to them, they seemed kind of impersonal and caught up in, uh, in something else. So I really looked for people who could teach. And what I find is that this kind of collective sharing effervescence and intelligence works exactly the same with folks who some of whom never even finished high school and got a GED mm. who have been through all kinds of struggles but it works exactly the same way there as it does at Columbia I'll give you I'll give you an example um, one thing that uh, I like to do more of at Columbia. I used to do it when, uh, when I taught CC, uh, is we'll have uh, close readings of texts. And you know, we did it, I think we did it with Heidegger, maybe in your class. You know, we'll take a text, you know, maybe Kant, Heidegger, something difficult. And uh, I do the same things up in Harlem too. And, and we go sit in a circle, and each person reads one sentence. And we don't go to the next sentence until everyone understands what the author was saying. It's not a forum really for discussion. It's just, a, okay, what was he or she saying? And what I find is that whether, at least personally, whether I'm doing this with Columbia students, uh, you know, so gifted, with so many expertises, be it economics or physics or you know lit crit, whatever it is, or whether I'm doing it with folks who have spent their their whole lives just trying to get by, some of whom have been in prison, et cetera, homeless. The experience is the same, and 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 no matter what the group, I find myself learning so much hmm. in doing that. So. I think the collective intelligence uh, is, is an incredible resource that we have on this planet. And it's just a question of trying to figure out how to tap it. Right. And how to focus it. I would still maintain because you have collective forces like the markets that, you know, do not, but um, yes, absolutely. And the focus would be to your credit. But before we move to square one, before we move to square one, and I ask you how you even ended up 
teaching from from your um, let's say enterprise as a lawyer to your enterprise as an educator how that happened i want to plug in one more question on square zero which is has as a matter of this conversation become your teaching method and another interesting thing that would happen in your classroom which is very very different from what would happen in most classrooms is the open endedness where you would say something very akin to what you just said which was who's to know is it karma is it my parents who's to know and that is just not the attitude of an academician except for if you're in physics if you're teaching physics and there is you know that space where you just do not understand why dark matter exists there is almost no other place i study psychology for that matter and we try to define human dynamic psychological systems with simple cause and effect fin uh, theories most of them have a replication crisis most of them do not work all academicians know that yet still they are so confident when they express the fact that this is it there is no open ended this is cognitive dissonance and that is the end of the story how is it that a teaching model is sustainable with so many who's to knows well you know in in zen they talk about zen mind beginner's mind and and i've always been struck by uh by what erwin schrodinger one of the founders of quantum physics said when he said that the uh any any field of human knowledge or expertise means nothing unless it's combined with all the other fields of knowledge um and i've always been struck and this is why i teach a course in hermeneutics uh, hermeneutics being interpretation the science of interpretation being interpretation that's right um is to how we humans uh put blinders on and we see things in such a specific way depending on our culture on our class on our gender and and these limitations are biological as humans we only see a a small sliver of what's out there visually or or hearing you know we only see very little culturally uh intellectually and and that uh the first therefore lesson in becoming a person who's aware and in touch is to try to lift those blinders i call this getting lost so uh many in many of my classes the real agenda is first to get lost to have us question our own assumptions that we never look at and that famous david foster wallace uh commencement speech uh, uh commencement speech where one fish two fish are swimming along and one fish says to the other how's the water and the other fish says what water, water. yep well that's us you know that right. that that is us so a good deal of this open endedness uh is is really uh intended to have us be able to widen uh our view and if we widen our view given the enormous creativity that all of us have if we widen our view then we can think out of the box and not only that then we can connect with each other better we have less preconceptions that limit our thinking and emoting hmm. both so so that's why uh so that's why the class is more open ended and 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 it actually has re resonance when i started you know reading physics of course it has a resonance with quantum mechanics and quantum physics which basically postulates that things only exist when they're measured hmm. right that's the so-called measurement problem of quantum mechanics but this this redounds so completely with our ordinary experience you know that if you're in a bad mood and you look at something that or or something someone said and you interpret it in a certain way hmm. right so in a way quantum mechanics is hermeneutics to the nth scientific degree hmm. 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 so you asked me how i how i got to do this are right. we in square one yet right we are at square one yet so how is it that a man hardened by logical principles of law 
entertaining something so open ended as an academician yeah well i think when i was a lawyer i had a reputation of being somewhat of a terror i was a litigation lawyer i would i would come upon a situation and and sue people and uh and what not i guess you could say it wasn't very buddhist <laughs> but, oh. so yeah what happened with me was i uh when i was about 15 somehow uh i got a, a hold of a book by dt suzuki called essays in zen buddhism and uh you know this was back you know this was in the you know, this is in that time you know i'm a boomer so it was back in the you know 60s 70s right i'm i'm older than i look so uh and and so i was reading the introduction to that book and he talks about when you fall in love for the first time your ego feels a split in itself because you found somebody other than yourself that you actually care for right and oh man that 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 got me as i was you know 15 16 years old i was very romantic i said wow you know isn't that great and so then i went and read alan watts the way of zen and then i was off to the races and and when the tibetans first started coming here i uh i used to hitchhike uh up to a place in in northern vermont which at that time was called tale of the tiger it's now called karma choling and that's where chogyam trungpa who was one of the first tibetans to come here uh was and when i got up there there were oh there were maybe i don't know seven or eight or nine people you know he, he went on to become very well known in some ways a little infamous but at that time there was hardly anybody there so uh you know so i started meditating and 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 speaking with him and learning about the tibetan approach to things and then uh that continued i became interested in sufism i remember when i was at uh, at tell the tiger there was one other guy there he was uh his name was shri n singh i wonder where he is today but he was a real <laughs> character to this. and he maybe that'd be great and he used to say to me are you interested in the esoteric like that you know in a very sing song way i just thought it was great So anyway, so then I went I meditated, I became a Sufi. I studied with uh, Pir Vilayat. I went to mosques and in the Middle East and what not. Uh, uh which at that time, you know, that was a different time when an American could go, it was okay. Um then I came back uh after traveling uh, around the world for you know, a long period of time, spending no money, living really close to the land. I came back and uh and i felt that my my uh my spiritual practice was too superficial hmm. i could sit and meditate and just as soon as i did it i my space would expand you know it was extraordinary but i felt i didn't know enough so i felt that i should uh become more incarnated hmm. why do you say more incarnated more incarnated i felt like i was just yeah as a 20 year old kid 22 23 however old i was 22 i didn't know anything and so i had this spiritual practice which was wonderful but i thought what good is it you know how how deep could it be if i don't really know about the world right so i decided i should become more incarnate so how should i do that maybe i become a craft person uh unfortunately uh if i did that i probably would have starved because it's not my talent. So but I did have a way with words. So yeah. I took the advice of uh actually a uh a a woman an anthropologist. Actually her name was Zakia Eglar and she was the first woman first woman or anthropologist of any kind to go into the villages in India and interview women. Hmm. standpoint of anthropology and she she used to tutor me in russian and turkish i used to meet with her and she had said to me when we were doing that when i was in college uh you should become a lawyer and so then as i was thinking what should i do it came back to me and i said okay i'll become a lawyer i will become more incarnate 
So I did that. I went to law school. I met a girl in a library. We looked at each other. We got married uh, very soon after that. Uh, You know, after a while, we had some kids. I became a lawyer, and I got really incarnated. You know, I really, I was there um, very much in the world. And then at some point after a couple decades doing that, I said, okay, I've become incarnated. Now what? So I sent an email to Bob Thurman, who I didn't know, who taught uh, courses in Buddhism at Columbia. And I said, I want to know what the Tibetans know, if they know anything. And he said, well, let me send you to... uh, Lozong Jamspal, who is a a Tibetan, a Ladakhi Tibetan from India, uh, uh, who was teaching classical Tibetan at the time at Columbia. And so I went to him and we started translating together immediately after he taught me the alphabet. And that was maybe 25 years ago. And since then, he and I, he's now almost 90. Mm-hmm. He's in Thailand now, but via technology. Since then, uh, he and I have been have been translating uh, every week for all oh, those God. years. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, please, please take it. So I guess that's it. So anyway, so yeah, John Spahn. And then, and then after a while, I said to Thurman, I said, well, you know, should I become a monk? What should I do? You know, I wasn't really seriously considering that. But he said, well, you know, for me, the university is like a monastery, mm. right? So I somehow applied to Columbia, even though I was, you know, older, didn't have, you know, much of a background. Somehow I got in the PhD program, and they just have never been able to get rid of me since then. <laughs> you know what? Uh, the phone call uh, served as like a break in the simulation because I was so lost um, in the story that you were telling. And I mean, I think, I think I almost lost sight of what question I wanted to ask you next, but I, I do remember, I do remember now. Okay. And my question is what at 15, you find, you found Suzuki and Watts. And after all these years of ups and downs through incarnation and the pendulum swing to, to, um, a monastery like lifestyle again to Tibetan Buddhism to, to, to Sufism. What is it that you've been trying to find? What is, what is this reach for? What are we getting at? To me, uh, uh, the heart and, and the mind are really the same. And so I've always wanted to understand what this was Hmm. you know i think in high school they voted me class philosopher you know some people have that disease i agree yeah and and you know what you know what is it i think it i think it's just the way just the way i'm constructed you know maybe it this could be some kind of karma you know maybe not it doesn't really matter but uh through using my own self as a laboratory dealing with my own shortcomings anxieties fears and ignorance um i'm fortunate to have a really good laboratory Hmm. with with all of these problems and dealing with life and i think to myself how can we break through this to understand this very strange human predicament that we find ourselves in and and you know uh there's nothing like a pandemic to focus you on the human predicament absolutely absolutely it's um, yeah. i was reading a post about how we've all accepted a simpler life and we have stopped asking for more given our predicament in the present moment and it, it's a testament to the fact that even if this is not sustainable it's imaginable it's possible and so you know that's a good place to begin inquiring and I agree with the fact that some people just have the bug of philosophy. It's almost like on the scale of problems, some people consider life to be the primary problem they want to resolve in their head before they want to move on to the smaller or the bigger. And um, at least that is the case for me. But I'm, I'm curious as to how um, a philosopher ends up talking, talking or even wondering about reincarnation. Why is reincarnation such an interesting theme to somebody who does not, and forgive me for saying that, culturally belong to the discourse around reincarnation? 
Well, it goes like this. When I was in college and, uh, and it was very early in the morning and I was sleeping and I woke up with a vision or dream and, and in the dream, and it was, it was not just a dream. It was extraordinary. I woke up and I went, what just happened? I was going up the Oxus River in winter. I was wearing furs around my, around my head. And then to the east, the sun rose from behind a mountain and illuminated everything. So this was back before the internet, I said, what is the Oxus River? I had never heard of the Oxus River. So and the name I looked was it clear up. to you in, in the dream? The name was clear? Yeah, the name was clear. Yeah, O-X-U-S, the Oxus River. And I, I looked it up in the dictionary and found that that was the ancient name for the river they now call the Amu Darya River. And... Uh, and it's, so I, I knew that the name Kite, my last name, um, means in Russian, because I had studied Russian, means China. Kitai means China, and also uh, in the Slavic languages. And that actually the name Cathay, C-A-T-H-A-Y, when Marco Polo went to China, really is a derivative of Kite. So... I thought to myself, maybe that is, you know, who knows, you know, Oxus River, Kate, who knows? I didn't know, I, I, I didn't know anything about Kate, only that it meant China. So I started looking things up and I found that the Kate were a people who came out of Manchuria and they're very warlike and they conquered China uh, and founded uh, the Liao dynasty. So it turned out that the Kites, when they were driven out of China, fled westward and set up a kingdom in Central Asia, which they called the Kingdom of the Kara, K-A-R-A, Kites, which means in Turkic languages, either the Great Kites or the Black Kites. And it turned out that that uh, kingdom was on the shores of the Amu Darya River, the Oxus River. Hmm. Now, it also turned out, as I researched it, that Genghis Khan's prime minister, who was a man named Yelu Chutsai. Yelu Chutsai, it turned out, was a Kite, hmm. very cultured. And he convinced Genghis Khan that rather than slaughtering everyone when he captured a city, that he should keep them alive and tax them. And so... Uh, so there's a whole strain of, you know, Yelu Chutsai. But then, then I had read a book called the, uh, by Arthur Kessler, who was a you know, very famous writer and years gone, gone by, called The Thirteenth Tribe. Now, my family is Jewish, come, coming from you know, where a lot of the European Jews come from, which is, uh, you know, kind of Poland, Russia, you know, from there. But in the 13th tribe, Kessler, he was trying to solve a question, answer this question, what, why are they all these Jews with blue eyes like me, hmm. right? <laughs> right? Where do they come from? And, and he theorized that, in fact, they were the descendants of a Turkic people who lived in Central Asia in the kingdom of the Khazars. And the Khazars found themselves, they were Turkic people, and they found themselves with the Muslims on one side and the Christians on the other side. And their king wanted to remain independent. So he decided that he and all his people would convert to Judaism. Hmm. Now it turns out, I believed, uh, that, that the kingdom of the Kites and the kingdom of the Khazars were separated only by the Amu Darya, ancient name Oxus River. Hmm. So what I figured happened 
was that a long time ago, my great, 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 great grandfather swam across the river and, uh, what's the polite term? And, uh, and, and fell in love with my great, 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 great grandmother. The bastard looked Chinese, so they called it Kite. Mm-hmm. Um, now, now, you know, this is long enough on this, but, but, but you know, you're asking me about reincarnation. So then, so then, a few years ago, I was at a meeting at Tibet House. Oh, you froze again. Are you still with me? I'm with you, I'm with you. And I met, and, and I met a, uh, a wonderful woman named Diane Wolf, who turned out to be a Mongolian scholar. And it turns out that Diane is a leading authority probably in the world, on Yelu Chutsai, this Kite, who was Genghis Khan's prime minister. And then she sent me, uh, just a year ago, some writings of Yelu Chutsai that describe him going up the Oxus River in winter. Huh. <laughs> so, but because, you know, but, but, but going all the way back to that, it, it was really an extraordinary thing that I couldn't really account for. And it opened my mind to the possibility of reincarnation or something else. And uh, so always being interested then in Buddhism, of course, reincarnation is very central to Buddhism as well as, you know, uh, Hinduism. Um, I really uh, became deeply interested in it. Hmm. And then when I, look at technology and I think about how technology is evolving um, and I think about quantum mechanics and I'm really wondering how all these things fit together. I'm a detective in search of an answer. Right. And I think even not just academically, even philosophically, I think it's very bold that um, this class attempts or you attempt to unify all these, uh, all these disparate, otherwise um, discontinuous fields of study. So we, in that class, delved, started with quantum physics, religion, philosophy, eschatology, technology. We did biology. We did psychedelics. And we did fringe experiences like near-death or end-of-life experiences and, and, and all of that. But in this, in this quest to sort of um, chase the architecture of your dream out, to figure out why that, that vision ever happened, you have rightly become a detective. And I have a question and it's, it's more of a doubt than a question. I, I figured, and this was me halfway through the class last semester, that it is not just that you've become a detective, but this classroom has become an experiment with sub detectives where you've learned or where you're trying to channelize the creativity of these young and, and different minds to bring at least a workable idea out as to why this phenomena might exist, how it might exist, how might we even bridge the differences between how we see the materialistic world and, and the spiritually ideal, this, this other half of the world that you've had a bite of. Am I correct in that doubt? Or is that me just going too far off? Well, I, 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 I appreciate the, you know, the collective intelligence. And there's no question that uh, a group of 35 smart people are more likely to figure it out than than just one, you know, no, no question. Hmm. Um, but I, it, it, to me, it's not, not so much result oriented hmm. because uh, I think that the answer could well be that there's no answer. In other words, even though I'm a sleuth in search of an answer, it could well be that there is no theory of everything. Hmm. You know, we have a great, uh, we have an instinct to have everything add up, everything makes sense. But, but we also know at a deep level that it doesn't make sense in so many ways, you know, this life, right? And part of, and part of the exercise in the present tense is learning to live with that. And, and, and I know that we, we uh, receive comfort and and light and warmth and insight from doing this together hmm. and i think the exercise itself is is worth it even if there's no answer and in some ways you could say that 
it doesn't matter what we're studying together. You know, it could be, you know, it could be woodshop, right? It could be mathematics. If we're doing it, if we're doing it together, then it becomes an experience of love and intelligence. That is the divine in us. Hmm. Hmm. That's very well said. Um, I've always felt that asking tighter, better, <clears throat> asking tighter, better questions is uh, far more important than having answers in any case. And I think part of education should focus on asking the right, better, tighter questions than, than, than you know, giving answers. It, part of it is accepting the humility of your limitation accepting that there is a certain boundary that you are probably not going to cross for whatever want or reason. Part of it is the open-endedness of being okay with uncertainty. As humans, we are designed for, for assessing certainty, prediction, you know, um, processing, all of that is a certainty um, affecting mechanism that we have. And I feel uncertainty has a lot being in the present has a lot, lot to do with being okay with uncertainty, has a lot to do with leading a very content and happy life. And I think this class, um, in, in some sense, also tries to enforce the principles of mindfulness in action, not so much in reflection, but in action. Uh, and, you know, reflective action would be a better word. But so um, I'm glad for that. But I wonder, uh, how is it that quantum physics, psychedelics, fringe experiences, biology, religion, eschatology, philosophy, all of them come together and point in this common direction that there might be something beyond the material death that we imagine to be the full stop to our continuous life. Well, I'm so happy that, you're, that you yourself, in, in what you're doing right here, you're just asking questions. <laughs> and how wonderful is that? And so you're, you're a living example of exactly the method, because I think when we ask questions, our minds open up, and our mind and the space within our minds expands. You know, in Buddhism, we talk about the four formless realms, right? Beyond the form realm, where we go infinite space, infinite consciousness, infinite nothingness, and then beyond all of that. Um, so uh, uh, this method of asking questions is a wonderful way for us to purify our minds. And, and then once our minds are more pure, then we can be our highest selves. Even if that's not perfect, it's our highest selves. So, so all of these different elements, you know, psychedelics, for example, which uh, from time immemorial, Soma, you know, to the Greek Eleusinian mysteries, you know, all the way up to the 1960s on the West Coast, you know, have been used by people to have different kinds of experiences. And so the question is, what are those experiences? What do they mean? Um, and now, of course, there's a lot of research that shows that those kinds of experiences can be of tremendous a value to people who are uh, suffering from emotional distress, either end of life emotional distress or PTSD, all of those things, great when wonderful research that's being, doing, being done. And then, then we look at this phenomenon of uh, uh, people having visions of UFOs. And I think, I don't remember if you were in this class, but we had a couple of students who had remembered these experiences from when they were little girls, exactly as described in some of the literature that, that, we, that we read. And so, and so what is that? And so we, we pair that with, um, with Pierre Corban's book, Creative Imagination and the Sufism of Ibn Arabi, because he posits Ibn Arabi, one of the great Muslim scholar mystics, one of the great great uh, people of all time, uh, what he calls the imaginal realm, which is not this physical realm, and it's not a separate mental realm, but it's somewhere in between, right? So what, what is this? How do we account for really thousands of people having these experiences? What does that tell us about, again, what happens when we remove our blinders? 
And then we look at some of the practices of, of Buddhism, for example, esoteric Buddhism, where, where uh, a practitioner will go through the process of death six times a day, at least. And, and we wonder, as the senses fall away, as we're dying, and we're in more and more subtle consciousnesses, at that point, does this kind of measurement principle of quantum mechanics, does this become really e effective? And so could that be a mechanism whereby some form of continuity takes place? In other words, if you have been practicing intensely for many, many years, so that a certain vision and going through the death process, you know exactly what it is, could that manifest itself at a very, very subtle level? Mm. And uh, so, you know, so we look at that, we look at science, we look at UFOs, we look at psychedelics, we look at religion, all of these are, uh, are means to understand the human condition and to perhaps remove our blinders, which will benefit us in the present tense, no matter, even if we don't have any answers, right? And perhaps may lead to a, some kind of uh, answer about what these things are. Hmm. And so, who knows? But, but, but by looking at the whole thing, and, and that's only best done collectively, but by looking at the whole thing, maybe we learn something. Right. And I mean, walking into the class, considering the number of elements that we were playing with, there were a few elements that I'd made peace with that did definitely point towards what the thesis of the course was, reincarnation, right? Uh, or it, they might not have directly pointed towards it, but they were enough to incite curiosity along the direction. So I had experimented with psychedelics myself and I knew that there was something happening there that I could not put into words properly. There is something that is so beyond the realm of the material to me that putting it in the words that represent things in the material world was insufficient. I also understood the same about religion. I could excuse religion because I've always felt that religion can construct a story about anything. And you know what? It's in the playing field of its metaphysics. I don't have a problem with that. The same with quantum physics, the hole that remains in quantum physics, be that the observation problem, the measurement problem, all of that. I understood that there is something to be filled for this gap. However, there were a few places that absolutely astounded me that formed the points of inflection for, let's just say my conversion. Right. The first one was um, day one when we went over the many cases of people who had recounted past lives. And I have been raised with a joke about this phenomena all my life. My grandfather vouches for the fact that he's met a few people like that. Every now and then one dramatized Indian TV channel will showcase something like that to get TRP ratings about somebody who can just recount the Vedas because he was a scholar in his last life or he knows something about his last life that he's not supposed to. But then we were listening to, we were, we were reading reports from more materialist media sources, ABC news. We were, we were listening to, uh, we were reading about new sources from places where I'd not expect that to be the case. Again, when we move forward, considering the materialist canon to be the proper place of sense making, we bumped across Pl uh, Plato's story of Ur, something embedded within the Greek material tradition, speaking of a reincarnation process very akin to what the Buddhists or the Jains or the Hindus were speaking of. And those were the point, the points of inflection were not in the domains that I was comfortable with, were in the domains that are absolutely used as evidence to strike down all claims of reincarnation. This cannot be, the media would be reporting it. This cannot be, there was so, there is a proper tradition of literature that says that there is no, you know, life after death. But those two places were absolutely, you know, um, and the third point was, in fact, finding out how many people close to me within that classroom would vouch for experiences like that themselves, near that experiences, experiences of end of life, all of that. And I, I would walk out of that class shell shocked every day and I'd be like, how is that? How is this change of mind happening at a pace that I cannot even comprehend? How do I even begin to make sense of that? What do you have to say about this, this particular range of phenomena? I, uh, I share your um in a way skepticism and you know i always my when i read stevenson uh you know stevenson so he was a uh, actually he's in the medical school at the university of uh, virginia and he did this 
two volume study on reincarnation and biology. You know, he had his team of of interviewers and they heard, would hear a study, a, a, they would hear a story about reincarnation, they'd immediately go and interview the family and the kid, uh, et cetera. Uh, most, most of which, just about all of which, uh, took place in cultures where reincarnation was accepted. So of course I thought to myself, okay, fine. You know, everybody believes in reincarnation, so it's kind of in the air. If reincarnation is really happening, then it, 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 we should find it in the West too, right? We should. And, uh, but you know what happens when we, when we dig a little deeper and we actually create a space where people feel safe to talk about these things is they do start to pop up. Not, not with the same frequency, I think, as you find them in cultures where this is accepted, but they do pop up up as in that ABC news story about the kid who remembered being shot down during the Second World War in a fighter plane. Um, but, you know, I think that there may be an explanation for that. And uh, now I'm way out on a limb here. You know, mm -hmm. so I'm not a scientist at all, but I'm just trying to put things together. You know, if, if in fact, uh, you know, as we go through the death process, uh, we reach a more subtle level of consciousness when, because of course we're no longer, if we, if we stop being able to see and hear and taste and smell and touch, then in a way we're less distracted, right? Uh, but, you know, if that happens, then, uh, then our measuring device, you know, is still our consciousness. And if our consciousness has been shaped uh, by a culture that thinks uh, materialistically, like when you're dead, that's it. You know, you are your body, that's it. Then it could be that that is also creating that reality. Mm. Whereas, whereas if in fact uh, uh, you have a kind of deep assumption, right, that uh, uh, that there is some continuity, or maybe if you're a practitioner, then you have a deep, deep practice based on years and years of concentration on exactly what that continuity looks like, then that could be outcome determinative. Hmm. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Michael Lockwood, who was a, a philosopher of science, uh, calls this the preferred basis problem in quantum mechanics, that why is it that certain states uh, seem to be associated with certain other states. And, and he talks about the mathematics of it and the vectors, et cetera, which is frankly beyond me. Uh, boy, in another life, I'd love to come back and spend years and years on mathematics and physics. Right. That's why we need the collective. So, but he talks about that, the preferred basis uh, problem. So, so it could be that there's a connection there that, uh, which would mean not not strictly from an idealist point of view, because I think it's more complicated than that. That if you're a Christian and you really, really, really believe in heaven or the other place, then it could be that either in your dying moments, in which time may seem an eternity, or beyond that you may experience what you expected to experience, what your measuring device was designed to experience. Hmm. So, so that's, so that's the, you know, one response to your question about that ABC news story. And then the story of Ur from the Republic. What's, what's most amazing to me is that, you know, mostly when you read the Republic and CC, who pays attention to that? And yet, it's the culmination of the entire book. The story of Ur and what he observed in his near-death experience about reincarnation. Right. Not to, mention, not to mention that the cosmos that are described in the, in the story of Ur uh, to a Buddhist sure as hell sounds like a mandala. Right. So... So, you know, and then, you know, these, these near-death experiences, you know, we had a, uh, in one of our classes, I think it was be before your time, but when we broke out into our little groups, 
uh, she had been, she was a, a woman in her, that time, probably around 60, and she had spent decades as both an emergency room nurse and as a hospice nurse. And she just mentioned to her group, oh yeah, there are five or six times when uh, someone flatlined and then uh, they describe what happened in the operating room while they were flatlined from a position other than that in which they were in physically. In other words, you know, sometimes from the top of the room looking down. Now, it's one thing when you read a book and, and some, you know, someone who's studied this or, uh, you know, this is in the woo-woo genre, right? Says, oh yes, there's this experience. This. It's another when you have someone right in front of you who is sober and grounded and looks you in the eye and tells you this. Mm. So, yeah, so those are the kinds of things that happen when you open up a space where people feel really okay to explore emotionally, safe, and when you shake up their intellectual foundations, like happened to you, a little bit, opening up these fountains of creativity. I have uh, I have two more questions before I um, let you do the fate of your day, um, and so I, 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 if if you're getting late, I'll make them very very quick. Um, the first question I have is if my reality is of the nature of what I ask is what I'm served, and if I also understand that the cycle of reincarnation is essentially a cycle of pain and misery repeated and the end goal is to in fact be alleviated from the chakra of karma, then why don't I automatically begin by believing? If, if I have the, let's say, the slightest of influence over my fate after death, why don't I start by believing that I want to escape this reality? Well... Um, if your belief is centered around yourself, then that's like a prison. Because if part of your belief is, I myself want to be liberated, then you've, in a way, constructed a prison of yourself mm. that will keep you, that will keep you in prison. Because, right. because what, what you're concerned about is that when you die, uh, yourself won't be there. So you're holding on to yourself, which, which, you know, is the big problem that Buddha tried to address in his doctrine of, of no self, meaning that, yes, there's a self. Here we are. We definitely have selves. But, but ultimately, if we really, really look at it closely, no. Mm -hmm. no. And, and the realization of that, that there's no kind of overdone or underdone self, but self with a capital S, and that therefore there's this deep interconnection. Itself is liberation. Nowhere to go. It's right. okay. Right. Right. Have you heard of the quantum suicide experiment? No. So it's like the it's it's like uh it's like the cat in the box experiment by Schrodinger. Instead, what we do is it's not the cat, it's me inside the box, right? And there is a gun pointing at me that is attached to a quantum calculator that will fire once the element goes, once the, the electron goes in a particular direction. So what the general idea is that I'm sitting in a box with a gun pointed to me and there is any, it's anybody's odd, which of the, which of the turns I will actually be shot and be dead. But turns out that, and this is in, this is in uh, sync with Hugh Everett's many worlds theory. What will happen is that I, my consciousness will branch out infinitely into the space where I actually live because only what I can observe, only what I can experience in the quantum domain is what is real. So in the, in all the, in all the case scenarios where I actually ended up dying, they never happened because my consciousness branched off into that infinite loop where I continue living. And that serves to become like, how would I say, um, a short circuit to the general idea of this class that I can basically never die. If, if quantum physics is the predicament of life, then I can never die. What do you have to say about that? So, you know, here is where my training as a lawyer mm. <laughs> raises, <laughs> raises its head. It strikes me as being 
a little too coincidental. Mm -hmm. Gee, we found a theory under which we can never die. Oh, right. So, yeah, we don't know. We don't know the answer. You know, it. It. And and one thing we do know is that given the history of science, quantum mechanics is not the final answer either. It right. will be superseded by probably another revolution, but it's what we have. And there have been very interesting ways to look at things from Everett's Many Worlds to the variation of that, that Michael Mensky and, and Lockwood talk about the many minds theory. You know, it's a lot of, it's a lot of fun, uh, for one thing. But also, uh, you know, in, in this experiment that you described to me, uh, you know, once again, we have such a premium put on the self. You know, if, uh, you know, as my wife said to me this morning, Jan said, you know, when it's your time, it's your time and it's okay. It's just the way it is. Hmm. There's some very, very deep wisdom there that right. even, even with all my philosophy, I bow down to <laughs> Doesn't mean doesn't mean we'll we won't doesn't mean we'll stop trying. Right, right. Because right. there are many wonderful things to be found, and maybe you or me or all of us together may learn something. Right. right. That we can use that we can use to make this world a better place. Because mm -hmm. you know, despite the uncertainties of what comes after this world for us, here we are in this world. So I love what you're doing in spreading, you know, the, the spreading the message of questioning. Uh, and so I thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. No, the pleasure's all been mine, Professor. Thank you so much for the class for four really awesome months. And I don't use the word awesome often enough. I'm very careful to not degrade it beyond the level that it deserves it, for, for an awesome four months last semester and for this conversation. This has been entirely my pleasure. Mine too. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. Bye.